please give a warm welcome to writer, director, Halfdan Ullman Tundal. Thank you for being here, Hafton. Um, the film goes from very realistic to this very emotional state and lyrical. Um, can you tell us about the, the genesis of that narrative arc? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was, uh, it felt First of all, I, I worked in a primary school for four years, and and I and I know that these kind of situations can turn into a bit of a nightmare for yeah. for the, for the parents, uh, and also with the like satirical elements in the film, you know the Kafkaesque kind of process of these constant allegations that keeps evolving uh, without you know any proof, but just like allegations mm -hmm. it felt natural to to take it into a more emotional nightmarish kind of condition mm -hmm. and it felt intuitive for me to do that and so but it was always plotted for them to you know dance and just become um just sur surrealistic slightly yes always planned it was in the first draft the dancing has been there the whole time, and um, I don't know, it just felt very natural to have it there. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about, I, I talked to you about the, the Bob Fosse influences, what, is that something that you visualize um, from the get-go? I mean, I mean uh, for me, all that jazz is, is like, uh, it's it's one of my biggest like inspiration on how to make films because it's so it's so free in its in its form uh, and I, I I feel so liberated when seeing films that are you know free in jumping between moods and tonality and things like that and it's so playful and actually the fir in the first draft of this film I I kind of just wrote the ending of all that jazz. But with the two mothers instead, <laughs> instead of the two directors. And but I love to hear the fact that you thought that this was f uh, freeing to you. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, for the average film goer watching your film, it's like a huge leap to watch this very realistic film. All of a sudden, it goes into, you know, dancing and highly expressive. But to you, as a filmmaker, it was. Freedom, uh, freeing. It was freedom. It, it, it was freedom, and it was like because okay. First of all, the school. Uh, I had a very, very clear vision of the school from the very beginning because I, I remember uh, sleeping over at my school when I was 12 years old, and it was a, that w that too was also like a hundred year old school, and 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 the school in the evening. It was so, it was such a big contrast between the school in the evening and in the day. Mm -hmm. Because it was so dark and silent and mysterious, and I felt like the ghosts of the school wake up, uh, woke up, and and I was really struck by that feeling, and I fe felt that anything could happen, you know, in the in the school when I was twel twelve years old mm -hmm. and sleeping over, and I wanted to have some of the same kind of mysterious feeling to this to this mm -hmm. school. This your lead actress, Ren it's Renata, right? Renata, yeah. Renata, we we love her in the worst uh, person in the world, and I mentioned Presume Innocent, mm. but this is like it's she's so fearless in this. We've never, I mean, it's that you know. Tell us about the ten minute laugh. Um, <laughs> is that something that was in the script that you always envisioned this? complete breakdown and us writing with it. Yeah, so so that has also been in the script from, from day one. Uh, and it So you scripted ten minutes of laughter. No, I scripted she laughs a lot and then she cries a lot. And then Renata read the script, that was back in twenty eighteen, and she she asked me how long is a lot? And I said about ten minutes. And she said it's impossible. I can't do it, and I said yes, you can. And then we never talked about the scene again. And then she did this. And you know, and tell us the the logic 
I mean, the nece- I, mean I, I saw the film, and it, it was a necessity to have that scene and yeah. to watch it happen. I mean, we've all been at funerals where we we start laughing uncontrollably, and it's so awkward, but yes. it's 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 necessary. What what was the genesis of having that scene? Exactly what you said. I in my grandmother's funeral, I started laughing uncontrollably, and I. It was a horrible experience for me and for the people around me uh, because it's so inappropriate in a way. And I felt it it um, it made really sense here because for Elizabeth, the 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 sort of allegations coming you know to the table, it's so absurd for her. And the way they treat this case, it's so absurd for her, and she doesn't know what to do anymore. So. So she, so she just starts laughing, and of course, she being an, um, being an actor also, I t- it made uh, it had another layer to it because then I could play with maybe she's just acting, maybe she's just being manipulative, trying to um, break or uh, sorry my English, but uh, yeah, ruin r- r- ruin the case in a way. Um, I. I admire immensely your mise en scène, the, your composition. Once the film starts getting, um, you know, emotional and surrealistic, your the composition of your the, the, I'm going to butcher his name, Paul Ulvik Roxeth. Yes. Um, did you guys plot everything out? Like, I, I greatly admire the scene with Sandra, and the parents in the room, but it all turns blue and you have the projection. Yeah. Um, can you walk us through yes. the composition? So so my first meeting with Paul, the DP, I said to him that I wanted to make Miss Ansen great again uh, in terms of, you know, leaving the TV series aesthetics a little bit. That has kind of. I'm sorry, leaving the TV series aesthetics. The TVs. Yeah. TV yeah. Aesthetics. Yeah. Because I, I think that has kind of, um, yeah, um, invaded the film uh, mm-hmm. a little bit. So we wanted to. For me, I'm I'm obsessed with, for example, the birch tree forest scene in the in Ivan's childhood by Tarkovsky, okay. where there is a dance between the camera and the and the actors, where, where there's a lot of different compositions in the same shot, you know, in going from a t- single shot to a, to a master shot in just a very organic way. So, so that dance between the actors and the camera was something that we really tried working on. And, and, and also Spielberg is, is a big influence on, on, on the mise en scène in the film. Um, and did you find the the constriction of the, the the classroom, you know, the the high school, yeah. was that for you a, a challenge or something that you loved the claustrophobia of having everything contained within that space? It was very strange because when I had the ID uh, with w- just one location, it was it felt like my mind exploded with with the opportunities that I could have in the school, you know. It was like endless for me. What what different scenarios and different framings and different lighting I can ha- have in this school in the evening. For example, the the blue projectionist. It's that was inspired by a Walter Murch book when he talked about the blue room, and 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 then I thought, of course I can have a blue room in this film also. You know, a private blue room, and and then I could have the projectionist. And so so every like it 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 felt so liberating working with one location and of course we we it it was really high demands on the location of the school we searched 300 schools in in the area where we're going to shoot it but we didn't find it there but then we we got the you know tip about this school and it yeah that was there are things that happen in the film that i'd love for you to talk to us about the fact the nose bleeds was that always part of the the script and we have the alarm bells that recur throughout the film all these motifs yeah. that at first seem just thrown off but they recur and and haunt us throughout the film yeah so so the nose bleed the, the genesis of that idea is that i'm a nose bleeder so i i i nose bleed in the most 
stupid situations, you know, every time I get a little bit stressed, I can no split. And it's so distracting for everyone. So I thought of it as a very distracting moment. And also the, 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 the similarities between the nose bleed and, and the fire alarm, is, it goes with the theme in the film, you know? They don't know if it's very innocent or if it's very serious, you know? The fire alarm, it could be a real alarm, uh, but, it, but they say it's broken, but in the end it rings again after they have said they fixed it. Is it real or is it not? And the nose bleed, you know, the, the one teacher said, this could be leukemia. But probably not, you know? But, so but, you so wanted us as well to be wondering if there was, there w if it was just to be casual, the, the alarm bells, or, but, or it was meaningful, the, the recurring. I, d I didn't want you to think too much about it, but I, I wanted, you know, all these elements, I wanted every element in the film to be in this gray area between is it serious or is it not? For example, the alarm bell, you know, if you're very a uh, very anxious person, you, the uh, your inner alarm bell can, you know, ring all the time, even mm -hmm. though it's yep. not real, you know? Uh, and, and I wanted this alarm bell to be your Elizabeth's kind of inner alarm bell. And, and for me, I, I, I don't always know if, I'm, if the alarm bell rings and if it's, you know, something I need to worry about or if it's just, you know, in my mind. Yeah. Um, the fact that you drop us into the story without any background. I mean, we find out throughout the movie that there is, a, there is background between Elizabeth and Sandra, mm. um, but you don't give us any background. You just drop us. Can you tell us that choice? And <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons for leaving the plot is that is uh, um, kind of a satirical reason because I, I feel that now in our, our society we, we are not able to talk about the case anymore. We, we start with the case, but then we start to talk about all the other things. You know, we, we can't, um, we, it's very difficult for us not to talk about the person, not to talk about the past, not to talk about the context of everything else than the case, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so for me to put in more and more distractions and then everybody kind of forgets the case and talks about, you know, the death of the brother and, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're trying to solve just a kind of regular incident between two children. Mm -hmm. But they, and then they forget it because it's starting to be about everything else. Um, and you mentioned the children. We, we, we don't see the children. We see a moment where they sing and we don't know where, where Armand is and who Armand visually is. You know, tell us about not showing us the children. Yeah, because the, the, um, a lot of the film happens, hopefully, in, in the audience's imagination also. So, so when they talk about the children, I hope that you, like, imagine the children through what the parents was like and what they say about the children, and then you can create you know, you know, your own, own Im image of the children in your mind. And, and that is also a little bit the same way that the school is treating the case, you know? so it's, it works on this, uh, on the, on this level as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought it was more interesting for, for the audience to, to mirror the, the, the children in the parents, not seeing the children in itself. And toward, uh, <coughs> At the end, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Renata's character says, don't judge a book by its cover. I'm mm. paraphrasing what she says. Yeah. Um, was that always the end? Is that something that you always wanted to be the end, to tell the audience, don't judge a book by its cover? Uh, yes, that was always the end, but in different versions. Like in the first draft of the, of the script, it, she said it to Thomas, who actually came back from the dead. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was also strange. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so she said it to Thomas, and then that didn't work completely. And then I had one that where she said it to, said it to Thomas while she was being abused by the other parents. But that was really strange. So yeah, 
it ended up with this. <laughs> and walk us through with your actors and the dance sequences. Mm -hmm. um, the first one with Renata in the hallway with the, 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 the sweeper, mm -hmm. which is so poignant. And then later on, we have the, the, the big <clears throat> climax with, you know, tell us about choreographing those, those moments. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so the first dance scenes, first dance scene with uh, with uh, cleaning worker was really supposed to be like the resurrection of Elizabeth. You know, mm -hmm. she she she, is on, she she starts on the ground and then she kind of carries herself up again and starts again to you know work for her son and herself. And it was just supposed to be like 30 seconds, one minute, but then five days before shooting it, the choreographer and Renata showed me a four minute dance. And I just happened to love it. So, and for me, filmmaking is a lot about just feelings. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I put it in. <laughs> and, um, and also I, th I think it was, it, for me it worked on several levels because I, First of all, I thought it was beautiful and it make, make, made me feel good, but also, you know, it, it kind of emphasizes the fact that now everybody's starting to losing their mind a little bit. Is it Elizabeth or is it the principal or who is, you know, what, what's what? And also to, to say to the audience, okay, from now on, every, everything can happen. So mm -hmm. just be prepared. <laughs> and, but I couldn't help but what was watching the film, the, how hard it must have been for your actor, for Renata. I mean, you put her through the ringer and you push her to the limit. Yes. Was that, you know, tell us about working. I'm, I'm not thinking just about that scene, but also the laughing sequence. You're, she's, she goes through a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, so after the, the laughing scene, we, we shot it for one full day, uh, 10 hours, um, which was crazy. and. The first half of the day, she kind of laughed in her acting, but after lunch, she kind of lost it for real. And, and then she got five days off after the scene. <laughs> and You're generous. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and, and, and of course, we talked a lot about, you know, we, me and Renata has been friends for 10 years before doing this. And so we had a lot of trust in each other, but, but um, Renata was really exhausted after this shoot. Uh, it was too much emotional, technical, physical scenes in too sh uh, short of a time. So she, yeah, she. But it, you had written it, this role with her in mind. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and trusting that she would deliver this, all the demands that you had on her. Yeah. Because I, I had seen it, you know, we had worked on a short film together and I'd, I knew what she was capable of and that was also before Worst Person in the World and I mean, sh she, and I still t think that she can do absolutely anything, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I was very impressed with the actress that plays, is it Sandra? Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's such a, I mean, she's the villain, she's so evil in it, but there is nuance and we, and we sympathize at the same time with her. You know, tell us about working, developing that character and working with her. Yeah, uh, she, she is one of the greatest actors in Norway, working in Norway. So um, it was a, a, a really good time working with her. But unlike Renata is super like, she's very outspoken. She's very uh, analytic. But uh, Ellen, who plays Sarah, is more quiet. She she wants to listen more to what I, I'm saying, and and then she just takes it in and, and plays. It. And and the the most important thing with the Sarah character was the feeling of shame. Always shame in different nuances. Shame because she she really hates Elizabeth, but not because of Elizabeth is Elizabeth, because but because she feels a lot of guilt for what has happened to Elizabeth, and she feels responsible for it. And when you feel responsible for somebody else's um, pain and, and, and destruction, you, you can f start to hate her for some reason. It's, it's a strange combination of feelings, and that turns into shame. So, and, and for me, it's not obvious that she has hit her child or, or something like that, but it's, um, for me, actually, I believe in her. The whole time, she is the only one I believe, but she doesn't get trusted. Um, one of the beautiful things about the film is the cyclical 
aspect of trauma and yep. and 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 abuse. Yeah. You know, can you, you know, tell us about approaching that aspect of the film that it's it's cyclical. Yeah. So, um, I, I, you know, the concept of of trauma moving in generations is is a quite common psychological concept, and I've you know experienced it and seen it myself in my family. I thought it. I, I thought that was really interesting. How you know something can just move on from generation to generation, and and I was thinking how to break that cycle, and I and I wanted to just like uh, explore what does what does that really mean? You know, when when something just moves in generation. For example, in Sarah's case, it, it's obvious that that violence inside the family has you know gone through diff several generations in her family. And I, I and I wanted that to be a, a part of it. And a, a lot of about the film is also about you know what has the children learned from the parents, mm -hmm. you know, and and um, so yeah, so that became a layer in the, in all. And of it. Um, the the rain sequence, which is yeah. so powerful, um, tell us about how the genesis of that. I mean, the beauty of it is that we don't. We don't hear. We watch, and and then the symbolism of the rain washing things away, our sins, etc. I mean, it's biblical. It's it's poignant. It's 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 stunning visually. Yeah, you know, you. tell us about how you arrived to shooting this. Yeah, that was for me in the script process. It was kind of a lightning moment because I struggled for many, 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 many years to find out the ending of the film. And then I got the idea of, because it, there's so much dialogue in the film also, but I got the ending of the uh, uh, film uh, solving it completely without dialogue. And then I thought about this schoolyard situation that kind of resembles also, you know, what we were going through as ch children, you know, different groups and where you kind of choose your group and mm -hmm. kind of this hierarchy and then uh, and I wanted, and I wanted it to be a, a super over dramatic scene inspired, actually quite maybe uncool reference, but Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> uh, I mentioned Tarkovsky also, so I can mention Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> you mentioned Spielberg. And, yeah, yeah. And yeah. we haven't mentioned Kubrick. Yeah, There's a yeah. lot of Kubrick in your film. Yeah. So, so for me, it was this over the top kind of super dramatic scene in the rain. Is it satirical? Is it a school schoolyard situation? Or is it just like the solution of the case? Is, you know, this is a modern witch hunt. Is she use, is Elizabeth using her witch power to get everybody on her side? And then Sarah is left alone in the, it's, it's, it was just so many like interesting aspects of, of ending the film mm. sort of uh, in the rain in that matter. Well, I, I, I'm in awe of listening to you because you're so intelligent about cinema and you mentioned earlier about the cycle within families. You're, you're the grandson of Igmar Bergman and Liv Ullman, which is amazing. And to see you grab on to the family genes, how, how, how do you feel about Carrying on the Ullman Bergman tradition with with a remarkable film that you've done. No, I try not to make films because <laughs> it had been done in my family. I felt, uh, but I didn't escape it. It. And has your grandmother seen the film? Yes, yeah, she, she saw the film at the Norwegian premiere, and she was she was in shock. In a good way. In a very good way. <laughs> not like, oh, in, my in a, God, this is not as good as in, what in a, happened. No, no, she was actually in a, in a very good way. And we talked through voice messages. So she left me a voice message and said how much she loved the film and also that my grandfather would have been very proud. Oh. So, yeah. Well, he, they, they should be. It's, yeah. it's a remarkable film. Thank and you, you yeah. should be extremely proud of what you've done. And, and the best is yet to come. Yeah. Thank you for being here, Hafdan. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Spread the word, people. Yeah.